Hi everyone, my name is Karthik Krishna. I'm the lead architect for Cisco Data Intelligence Platform. Today I'll be talking about Big Data Meets AI. There were questions around what uh, Cisco is doing on AI. I'll be talking about AI in the context of Big Data and, what, uh, and also some of the innovations that we are doing on advanced analytics. I will be covering on data intelligence trends. So what are some of the use cases uh, the customers are seeing, which is evolving uh, data pipelines much beyond a data lake? And how is the ecosystem adopting to this? What are some of the new projects that's happening in the data lake ecosystem, such as Hadoop 3.0? Uh, and what is happening as well with Spark, Spark 3.0? Finally, I'll be touching upon Cisco Data Intelligence Platform, which is bringing all of this together in a co cohesive, simple fashion where Hadoop, AI, uh, and Kubernetes all work together. Regarding data intelligence trends, primarily around a data lake, uh, data machine learning was kind of default, uh, was available from Hadoop 1.0 days, even with MapReduce, and uh, data lake adoption in enterprise has been going on for the last six, seven years. And over the years, machine learning uh, libraries got added on, and with Hadoop 2.0 onwards, newer data pipelines started emerging. This was largely enabled through Spark and Spark streaming. So you had a Lambda architecture, which had a speed layer, a batch layer and service layer. You had Kappa architectures. So many new data pipelines emerged. But what has been happening over the years with newer use cases, newer use cases such as uh, AI uh, working closely on AI operations happening on data sets and a data lake is evolving or bringing new set of use cases where uh, the data pipelines are much beyond are going beyond a data lake. These use cases could be object detection, face recognition, image re recognition, natural language processing, uh, uh, sentiment analytics, or even uh, driverless uh, car autonomous driving, all of these and fraud analytics. So these are touching various different industries, whether it's retail, utilities, car manufacturing, transportation, uh, financials, fraud analytics, and even healthcare. So let me give a, a simple use case of uh, how, when you're building autonomous driving cars, what are standard RFPs, what are standard use cases that a customer wants to develop and enable to enable these things? Uh, this is just showcasing one example. As I did mention, this is true for various different use cases, but Consider a car which is being uh, used to generate, collect a lot of data to generate this data on which you want to build models, you want to build inference, and so that uh, you are able to enable an autonomous driving car. So a typical car generates one and a half to two terabytes an hour. And if you're considering a, a one day, it's running for eight to 10 hours, you're looking at 15 to 20 petabytes. And a car manufacturing firm might be considering close to anywhere from 50 to 200 cars which they are sending out to collect data, different use cases, different situations to collect this data to run uh, analytics on it. So what they do, once this is done, end of day, you're collecting anywhere from half a petabyte to two petabyte of data, which is typically ingested to Hadoop. Hadoop is very good at massive ingest rates, can handle very high even at petabyte scale ingest rates. It's very good at data intensive workloads where you are able to do workloads where you have to do tra fast transformations of data and, and it kind of emerges as a hot data. And on top of it, now if you want to run training and simulation, this is a compute intensive workload where it often leaves a data lake to emerge in a stack which is evolving around a Kubernetes as a standard. So you might be doing millions of simulations or hundreds of thousands of simulations on a on CPUs and GPUs for training. You're doing trainings on GPUs uh, typically, or doing simulations on CPUs and GPUs, all of these cases where it's a different farm. And then you might also be storing uh, an, an object store or a different store, which could also be working as an archival tier. So object store has multiple use cases. I'm just show, showcasing this pipeline, using it as an archival type tier to enable an exabyte scale. So, uh, so this is a pipeline which is much beyond uh, the Hadoop 2.0 kind of pipelines that was emerging of the Lambda architecture. And if you look at this, this is really uh, what is happening is there is a data intensive part where a data lake handles it well, which is uh, 
typically around a Hadoop use case, massive data ingest. You can do petabytes at a, in a day, transform it, and you can even gain near real-time analytics. You can even transform, uh, or also Hadoop allows for data tiering. And this is compute moving to data, so uh, it's data intensive. For, for to be able to do training and uh, simulation, you're looking at a compute farm where you're handling tens of thousands of cores, and again, thousands of GPUs for both training and simulation. And this is a container world. This is largely dominated again by uh, with Kubernetes emerging as a standard there. AI applications running as either TensorFlow or PyTorch applications running in a container environment with attached with a few GPUs. And also an object store, which works uh, well in many places. If you're only considering images or if you're considering smaller files, or if you're considering also as a data tier, object store is emerging as a standard, it's a standard in the cloud. But if you're looking at on-premise, uh, data lake or how driven by HDFS has been a more prominent player, but with Spark on Kubernetes, this is evolving as a, as a play as well for a data lake. So to make, it's a convergence of some of the largest open source projects to enable these data pipelines and enabling a newer disaggregated architecture. So, so these use cases is also creating, this is not, as I mentioned, this is not a one-off use case uh, alone. This use case is, is emerging in different verticals across different, uh, uh, different industries. And there is a lot of ecosystem projects which is being done, which is some of them are in tech preview, some of them are in the incubator, which are, all plan, are about to go G in a, in a quarter or a two, which is enabling these uh, disaggregated and heterogeneous pipelines. Let's take a look at a few of them. With Hadoop 3.0, Hadoop uh, has been gone through three generations of MapReduce in the first, the second generation allowed for data pipelines with uh, Spark and Spark Streaming and Kafka, all of them working together. 3.0 wanted to bring, brought in AI into a data lake. So to do this, two things had to be done. So to enable AI, you have to have GPU as a resource for computing. So now YAN was upgraded to enable not just CPUs and, uh, not, and memory as a compute resource, but also GPU as a compute resource for scheduling jobs. And as you are familiar, most AI workloads, which run in a, run in a container context, there are a lot of uh, moving variables, tens of law application works with this specific CUDA or, or, uh, or these specific applications all working together. So this has evolved around a container world. So most often you're running a TensorFlow job or a PyTorch as a container application attached to one or more GPUs. So to enable AI workloads, you also need a Docker environment within a Hadoop context. So YARN also provided and provides a first-class citizen support for Docker containers within a data lake. So YARN now can schedule an AI application. This is, uh, we even published a validated design with uh, working closely with NVIDIA and Cloudera a year ago, where now you can run a TensorFlow job where Yarn will schedule a Docker container with one or more GPUs attached to it to run a TensorFlow job. Now this was limited to only a single container running this application. More on it uh, further. And in a parallel world, Spark, uh, which was introduced with the Hadoop 2.0 about a year and a half uh, ago with uh, Spark 2.3, brought in support of Spark to be run in a container, Docker container context. And now also brought in that support for Kubernetes. So now Spark can not only run as a uh, as an application, as a, as a workload on YAN on a data lake, now you can run it on a Kubernetes world as a Docker container and bringing in uh, elasticity. Now the challenges were that this was not really adapted or there were no GA products uh, uh, many things are changing now. That is the exciting part in the Hadoop world where Spark can now run on Kubernetes, though this, uh, the validity or uh, GA was almost a year old. And with Spark 3.0, which is tech preview, it's kind of changing the landscape even further. Uh, this is going to probably go GA in a couple of uh, quarters. This is already available as a tech preview with Cloudera and other application stack where we even uh, published a block with uh, NVIDIA uh, closely working with them and uh, doing a demo together. How would you, how would Spark work with GPUs? So now you can run 
distributed deep learning jobs directly in the context of yarn that is you have a spark executor directly attaching to a gpu and you have 10 executors you have 10 gpus working together for a job or you can also run it in a docker context where you can now have 20 docker contexts dockers running gpus with one or more gpus attached to it so distributed deep learning is becoming seamless this is also not just enabling distributed deep learning this is enabling a much richer work uh, workloads in a data lake context uh, in the sense your some of your etl workloads can be accelerated as well with gpus some of your uh, uh, querying as well can be accelerated with gpus this is from a context of spark but if you're looking at a lot of things happening in the distributed deep world, uh, deep learning world uh, this was something we also demoed with uh, working closely with uh, cloudera last strata in uh, strata world uh, and this is Apache Submarine. It's tech preview. Uh, potentially, uh, this might, this might, this is. Uh, these are all going to be GA in a few quarters or uh, in the near term. And what this allows is within a data lake. This is not just in Yarn. They also support it on Kubernetes. So you are now seeing a world where there is a convergence of a data lake and a Yarn and Kubernetes. They both play together, uh, and where you can now run a job with. Uh, I want to have. Uh, 20 GPUs working on this job or 40 GPUs working on this job that is possible with uh, applications which give you a complete uh, workload manager for an AI workload. And Ozone is also a second file system that is emerging right within a Hadoop ecosystem context. So you have HDFS since day one, since last uh, seven, eight plus years. Uh, Object store is becoming very relevant, not uh, on on premise as well. This is not just for an uh, not just for uh, archival tier, but it is also for uh, Hadoop as uh, HDFS is good for large files and it has a limitation of 500 million files. But if you're looking at AI, you might be collecting millions and even billions of objects, billions um, of images. To do that, object stores do work well and can handle a lot more small files and also provides a good uh, storage and uh, control uh, storage and compute separation and also provides for a better uh, uh, data tiering better tco these are some of the projects happening in the ecosystem to enable big data meets ai and also allow for a disaggregated architecture Cisco Data Intelligence Platform is bringing all of this together in a seamless fashion where Hadoop, AI, or TensorFlow, Kubernetes, all of them work together uh, in a cloud scale. In the sense, they work as a single cohesive unit, uh, enabling a cloud scale architecture, which is fully modular, bringing and eliminating uh, uh, silos. If you had to do this even six months ago, or even if you had to do this a year ago, for these use cases, Data Lake would not talk to Kubernetes platform or uh, there was not really a richness of APIs for communication or there was object store to work in this context. There was no uh, compute uh, layer at all evolved to enable this. With all these ecosystem projects happening, uh, Cisco Data Intelligence Platform is eliminating this architectural cyclos and enabling big data meets CI, giving the user multiple use cases where if you are running a data intensive workload where uh, compute most to data is a better context, you can run it on a data lake where it is a compute intensive workload where data moving to compute makes sense so that you can give a much more richer uh, heterogeneous compute to work with on a Kubernetes platform and uh, enabling different applications that is being enabled as well. Now, how we are doing this is uh, there are multiple uh, uh, layers of it. And first layer I'm going to talk about is how we are enabling this with our ISVs. This first phase is going to be through Cloudera, where we are working closely with Cloudera and also with uh, uh, the compute uh, uh, players as well, where we already have published and we have uh, worked with Cloudera over the last seven years, publishing multiple validated designs, having thousands of customers. The data lake continues to be the Cloudera data platform data center. But what is new is the compute layer with, which is being brought together through Kubernetes provided by Red Hat OpenShift and Cloudera data platform private cloud. 
what this brings is now you have a dedicated uh, 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 kubernetes platform dedicated for cloud era private cloud in the first phase it will get opened up to a more other enterprise uh, kubernetes but what it brings in is now you can run spark jobs on a data lake on your hadoop or yarn context which is in the bottom left or you can run it now in kubernetes uh, context why would this uh, and this is being enriched by a lot more features uh, so far we never had personas in uh, in hadoop so every user gets onboarded to a similar context and then they have to scramble together hey i'm a data scientist i'm a data engineer where am i going to get my uh, uh, kind of a zeppelin uh, context or a, a jupyter notebook where are my gpus how do i do this it's a very complicated world but with kubernetes it opens up to a lot of new things uh, cloudera is enabling five personas four or five uh, there is a data engineer context with for etl workloads which are uh, where you can now launch your own uh, cloudera uh, self service portal saying i i want to run etl so uh, most of your applications required for etl get spawned and provided to you and also you can have a data analyst for data warehousing applications kind of context and a data scientist enabling all the G, uh, gpus uh, compute uh, and uh, tensorflow based applications on this this also enables uh, edge based applications when you are looking at a data flow uh, kind of use cases the second uh, also is this will enable us for hybridity if you kind of look at the hadoop world or a data lake it is not um, it it is it, it is bound by a lot of data gravity in the sense most of your applications are all together either all are in the cloud or all are on 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 premise because you have many applications it's an ecosystem working together if at all that you could make it hybrid this context where uh, with kubernetes which can stretch now uh, being hybrid both on prem or on, on the cloud or a multi cloud strategy is being technologically viable and the adoption might come a few quarters down but it is at least being enabled in the first in, in as we go in this fashion and there is also an object store that i did talk about which will enable also a dr uh, in the cloud uh, again allow for your multi cloud or a hybrid strategy both with kubernetes and an object store and in this context uh, you are also seeing now object store having a compute layer where the computer is in kubernetes running spark applications ai based applications which was not existing earlier so there are a lot of things happening in the ecosystem enabling this uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, data pipelines enabling more richer use cases as well and and just to iterate on a couple of interesting things is uh, environmental consistencies so now you can say goodbye to all the shadow it's so you have the same environment in the kubernetes context where a user can uh, uh, self service to build a development environment can be used for the same testing and you can deploy it to production and you can scale it from 10 containers to 10000 containers uh, with a click of a button and you are writing all your applications to a container uh, kubernetes context or a dial tone so it becomes much more uh, application portable becomes much more portable across uh, clouds as well and uh, personas is something i did talk about and uh, utilization as uh, uh, of course with uh, much richer no longer is your compute going to be defined by how your data node compute has to be your compute cluster can define much richer forms of cpus different uh, speeds different types of uh, cpu gpu fpga as well and uh, and build all the innovation that is happening in this space for example uh, with uh, even apms can be uh, used for your more richer fine grained uh, observability we did speak uh, all, uh, primarily on feature enablement ecosystem enablement through an application stack and how we are working with isvs cisco is also uh, building architectural innovations working closely with intel we all our validated designs are on the latest of cascade uh, uh, cpus we also this is a fully supported uh, stack platform with both infrastructure and uh, software and pre validated and we are working with nvidia since one and a half year since the hadoop 3.0 days enabling ai based applications in a data lake we also uh, published with them as you as i did mention a 
full demo on how you could do Spark 3.0 enabling distributed deep learning on uh, on uh, with GPUs with Spark 3.0 in a data lake context in a yarn context. We will you will uh, uh, stay tuned. We will be seeing much more on the ETL and uh, querying use cases as well on on that part. And we are enabling this not just in Yarn, but also Kubernetes. So now, over time, you would see that many use cases, uh, transient clusters, uh, shadow IT, all of them will fold. And many of your jobs, which are in the test and development phase, and many non-data intensive workloads will, might start being landing in a Kubernetes environment and giving a lot more features for, for our customers and enabling these newer data pipelines. We've also published over two dozen world record benchmarks with TPC XHS. XHS is a Hadoop throughput workload. We have proven linear scaling. We are the only one to have published both 100 terabytes and 300 terabytes in a single rack uh, uh, showcasing scaling. This is a modular architecture. Uh, if you've been in this context, you would have seen that a lot of customers have been asking, can I separate compute and storage? How do I do that? It's done in the cloud. How can you do it on-prem? We didn't really have much of the ecosystem available as a product to do that, uh, other than just separating out a YAN-only node, just doing compute. But this is bringing together a Kubernetes context to do your separation of storage and compute, enabling this modular and enabling this modular architecture. And and this is all offered as a through centralized management. So if you look at this, uh, we do have a, a, a wide variety of portfolios of servers. A data lake is a balance of storage and compute. Uh, you have a lot of cores uh, and a lot of nodes to cater to that. And a Kubernetes is primarily uh, both sized and looked at as I need 10,000 cores and so many, maybe 1,000 GPUs or whatever, or it could be a small context too, but it's all primarily around CPUs and GPUs. And you have a variety of servers catering to that. And if you're looking at an object store, it's largely a storage play. So these are heterogeneous servers all working together through a single pane of glass management, which is brought to through Cisco Intersight. So while I did talk about this for cloud scale, that you could have this deployed for 10,000 nodes or thousands of nodes, because when you're looking at an autonomous driving, when you're looking at exabyte scale, you're looking at thousands of nodes, or uh, uh, and it's quite common. And it's modular that you can only grow your storage or only grow your, grow your compute cluster or or your data lake. But this is not meant for just a, a, a cloud scale. This is meant to cater to these new data pipelines, which could even be under a petabyte. So you could have this deployed within a rack to having like eight, 10 nodes for a data lake and uh, additional nodes. Uh, the data lake could be both just HDFS or object store because that world is evolving and uh, happening in the on the on-premise context. But this is allowing for those new data pipelines, which was not otherwise possible and were siloed, all bringing together in a single, uh, single rack and scale uh, independently. Now, when you're building this to scale as you build it and then start growing, one of the biggest challenge is how do I operationalize this? I have maybe 10 different varieties of servers for my compute layer, for my storage layer, or my, for my Hadoop. How do I manage them? Uh, how do I manage even configuration drift? This is where uh, with Cisco, entire infrastructure management is policy driven. So you define your policies, whether it's for your Kubernetes compute cluster, compute farm, or your data lake, or your storage unit, and, with, and also for your networking layer. All of this is fully policy driven, saying what application talks to what, what are my uh, network policies, what are my application stack, what are my BIOS policies, all the way up to the OS, and can be fully managed and uh, uh, single pane of glass management, enabling a quicker time to value, and also enabling or eliminating configuration drift, because you're managing thousands of nodes, it's quite possible uh, your configuration uh, drift could be reasons for many of your uh, problems, and that is easily managed through this. And we also have deep packet inspection, very fine granular uh, troubleshooting so that you see packet drops, all of this architecture are deployed as a multipath. We call it flowlets here, but uh, but all our, your flow can take many of the paths based on uh, congestion considerations. So if you have packet drops, where do you see or latency changes, which path did it really take? So it's quite tough, tough to pinpoint. 
So all of these are bubbled up all the way so that through a single pane of glass management, you can fully monitor it and troubleshoot it. And also the APM through app dynamics brings, gives, enables Kubernetes for a better monitoring as well capable. So I just wanted to conclude saying a lot of exciting things happening in a data lake, primarily driven with the convergence of these AI, Kubernetes, and Hadoop, and also enabling an object store story for on-premise data lake uh, scenarios. And this is, we are bringing this with through Cisco Data Intelligence Platform, where we are collaborating with in industry leaders, whether it's the software stacks with Red Hat OpenShift or Cloudera or uh, the object stores. Also, we are working to build architectural innovations with uh, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, and even uh, FPGA considerations to build this very flexible architecture, which is validated, fully validated, supported, and also enabling the customer to try out even newer models, newer use cases. About uh, the projects I mentioned were uh, just a few. There are a lot more applications and incubator projects happening to even schedule jobs across YARN, across Kubernetes. So this is uh, uh, this is kind of exciting thing happening in the in the data lake front. 